Miriam, you are I'm a sure you I are am. a very I prominent you're a very prominent uh, spokesperson. You're a voice. You're a very prominent convert to Islam. You have a voice. I'm not, I don't call if, myself if, a convert. Okay, so don't well, call right. Me uh, one. Whatever it is you you, you yeah. want to call yourself, you have a voice. Here are some problems that are coming up, which have been exposed in schools that seem to be teaching very seriously unpleasant things, and they're being taught by some extremist Muslims. Douglas Murray shines a light on a paradox that has long perplexed societies. Should we tolerate the intolerant? The debate you are about to see took place a few years ago after it was exposed that there were schools in the UK that were teaching students certain radical Islamic ideologies. The debate is ever relevant even today. At the heart of this debate is the question of whether tolerating views and practices that fundamentally reject others' freedoms is contradictory to the values of a liberal society. Douglas Murray did not hold back. Back to the state schools, let's get back to this particular issue and the, 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 the alleged extremism that has been going on. Uh, not, not, the, not the Trojan horse context, we don't want to conflate two issues here. But Douglas Murray, you know, 95% of children in a particular area are of the Muslim faith. Uh, you were complaining in your article in The Spectator that in one primary school um, music was banned. That, that's kind of another issue. But raffles and tombolas were banned. I mean, what do you want to do? Do you want to encourage Muslim children to gamble? What's your problem with that? Should it, ref it should reflect the nature of the school. Yeah, so first they came for the tombolas. Um, for what? what? Look, um, <coughs> The, the problem the gambling going, going on here, wrong the, in those problem, the problem going on here is that we're in the middle of, of a debate. I mean, the nation is going through something very substantial change, and I think that what we've been discussing in recent days and what we've been discussing this morning kind of reflects this. Um, I mean, until very recently, you know, if you said to people, and it comes back to the British values thing as well, if you said to people until very recently, what is Britain, what are British values, you'd have got a fairly clear um, reply along the lines of, you know, a Protestant Christian country, we have institutions of church and state and monarchy and so on, which represent the country. As one of the results of mass immigration of recent decades, there has been a substantial change in the country. All sorts of good things have come from that, and some negatives have. But one of the things that has come from it is this, uh, this confusion about what it is we are. We want to be open and tolerant, we want people to be able to practice their faiths, we want pe people to be able to express themselves and live the lives they want to live. What we're finding it very hard to do at the moment, and I mean the French secular example has already come up, is to work out where our lines are drawn as a nation, because they're not clear at the moment. It's we're in the middle. Draw those lines, isn't it? It, 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 it may prove impossible. It may be that we do something like the French state did and try to draw very clear lines. That's what you've heard in recent days, there's a bit of it already this morning, that you know, there's a problem with some schools that are actually you know, state secular schools that happen to have had... How bad are these um, problems? Uh, the problems exposed in, uh, in uh, Sir Michael Wilshaw's report are, are pretty serious, and there's, there's more to come. Um, really, what's, about what's so teaching. serious in the report? I, I, think, I think, for instance, I mean, Wilshaw himself says that these children are at risk of cultural isolation. Uh, there have been findings of children, for instance, being taught in assembly to chant anti-Christian chants and so on. This is, this is very unpleasant sectarian and stuff. Douglas Murray's examination of the fine line between tolerance and intolerance in modern Britain is a critical conversation that questions the limits of our liberal democratic values. His viewpoint emphasizes that the concept of tolerance, while fundamentally virtuous, can be twisted into a form of permissiveness that enables intolerant ideologies to take root in society. This, he argues, is especially relevant in the context of modern Britain, which has seen a significant shift in its cultural landscape due to mass immigration. Statistics have shown that the UK has experienced considerable demographic changes over the last few decades. According to the Office for National Statistics, net migration has added to the population growth, with figures showing hundreds of thousands arriving annually in recent years. While this has brought a rich diversity of cultures and ideas, Murray points out that it has also led to a sense of uncertainty about national identity and what it means to be British. Other commentators and thinkers have echoed similar thoughts. David Goodhart, in his work on the subject, discusses the phenomenon of somewheres and anywhere somewheres being people who are rooted in a particular place or community, often valuing tradition and national identity, and anywheres being the more mobile, educated class who see themselves as citizens of the world. Murray taps into this narrative, suggesting that the rapid pace of change has left many somewheres feeling disconnected from their own sense of national identity. Murray's argument is not against diversity or the presence of different cultures within Britain. Instead, it is a call to recognize that unmanaged, large-scale immigration can challenge the cohesion of society if not accompanied by a robust framework for integration that respects the host culture while welcoming new influences. <laughs> Douglas Murray, you can't 
force people to believe things. You can't no. shoehorn people into a particular Douglas Murray shaped I have no intention David Cameron-shaped Britishness, no. can you? No, I mean, this is part of it. By the way, just, just very quickly I mean, on, this, on this matter of this, I mean, I do think that one of the things... But that address this, that this, issue about... Okay, can I just mention first, one of the interesting things that's come up in recent days and weeks, I think, over this whole Trojan horse business, is I think that some Muslims in this country, in particular a lot of Muslim, a lot of Muslim spokespeople, a lot of Muslim groups have been furious about these revelations and are now denying them, they're still denying them. And this is something like happened in the Catholic Church over the paedophilia scandal. Yeah. People just don't want to admit it. They don't want dirty laundry to be aired in public. They genuinely, they generally it's think that. Wrong. And that's why there's, there's still this denial, even now. The there's an official report by Sir Michael Wilshaw. It's found some very disturbing things. Some people still this, think that they don't, don't exist. Is this the same Sir Michael Wilshaw and, who just did a U-turn and what Gov did or and, didn't and, tell and, him? But you, you're, Mary, Mary, the thing, either you think this has all been, do you think this has all been made up? Uh, well, I, I think Do you think it's all been made up? What I actually know is that there are serious governance issues, there have been internal administrative issues, whether there are issues of extremism, which is what you're peddling, and what in fact the publication you work for is peddling by publishing one of the worst covers in this country that I have ever seen, oh, suggesting that just... young children are vehicles for um, extremism and Nikki. terrorism. You should be ashamed Nikki. to be yeah, even associated with that. Can I just give, this is a very good example of the problem. Miriam. You are I'm a sure you I are am. a very oh prominent you are a very <laughs> prominent uh, spokesperson. You are a voice. You are a very prominent convert to Islam. You have a voice. I'm not, I don't call I, myself if, a convert. Okay, so don't right, call me whatever one. it is you you, you yeah. want to call yourself, you have a voice. Here are some problems that are coming up, which have been exposed in schools that seem to be teaching very seriously unpleasant things, and they're being taught by some extremist Muslims. Why, Extremist. in this debate, you first of all deny that that is going on, and secondly, I've think the problem is a spectator cover cartoon. I've I never denied that there are issues. I do not understand. On these three, the I've problem is not the spectator issues. cover. Douglas Murray has long been a vocal critic of the reluctance within Western societies to have frank and open discussions about the origins of extremist ideologies within Islam. He asserts that Islamic extremism is not native to Europe, but an imported problem that requires an honest assessment. This notion is a response to the concern that many European politicians and public intellectuals, including those within Muslim communities, often approach this sensitive issue with an excess of caution, sometimes bordering on denial. Murray's position is that such reticence is not without consequence. By avoiding direct engagement with the uncomfortable aspects of radicalization and the elements within Islamic ideology that extremists can draw upon, there is a failure to address the problem adequately. This avoidance, he suggests, is often rooted in fear, fear of being labeled as Islamophobic, fear of provoking community tensions, and fear of admitting that multicultural policies may not always be effective. Backing up this viewpoint, there are statistics and reports highlighting a concerning trend of radicalization across Europe. The 2016 Global Terrorism Index, published by the Institute for Economics and Peace, indicated that there was a marked increase in terrorism-related deaths in OECD countries, with a significant portion linked to jihadists inspired by a radical interpretation of Islam. The report also emphasized the role of homegrown extremists, many of whom are second- or third-generation immigrants, pointing to the complexities of cultural integration and identity. Murray's stance is that silence and avoidance do not protect communities, but rather leave a vacuum that extremists can fill. By not challenging the narratives that underpin radicalization, there is a tacit allowance for them to proliferate. He urges European societies to uphold their liberal values by defending the right to critique and question, even if such discussions may be uncomfortable. 